2 Chronicles 28, verse 1. If you would, please stand in honor of God's word. We are looking at King Ahaz tonight. And if I get my tongue tied up and say Ahab, I apologize. Because sometimes I, I go back and forth, but I mean Ahaz. Everything I say means Ahaz, okay? Will I say it or not? Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? God, we have choices that we make every single day, Lord. A choice to walk on the wide road or a choice to walk on the narrow road. We have a choice to walk with you, to acknowledge your unseen presence, to live in mercy and love, contentment, gratitude. Or God, we can grow bitter and angry. We can refuse to forgive and walk in sin and follow after idols. That's our choice. I pray, oh God, that tonight in looking at the life of these kings, we will choose life. We will choose to walk the good path. We will choose to follow your will for our lives and allow you to do a mighty work in our families. God, speak to us tonight and we'll give you glory and praise for it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. There have been a string of great kings. It started with Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, over 130 years of great kings sitting on the throne. That didn't mean they were perfect. They made mistakes and did some dumb things. But for the most part, we would look at these kings and say they were good kings. In fact, Jotham, the Bible said, had, had absolutely nothing bad to say. I mean, he was in that very small category of Daniel and, 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 and Joseph where the Bible has nothing bad to say about these guys. And there's nothing bad about Jotham. But in the very same way, when Ahaz takes the throne, the Bible has nothing good to say about this guy. I mean, it goes from very, very good to very, very bad very, very quickly. So tonight, we're going to look at the the life of King Ahaz. And brother, I'm telling you, this character, he's going to reign for 16 years. And these are 16 of the worst years Judah will ever have. In fact, it amazes me how he crams so much wickedness and evil into these short 16 years. But he does it. I mean, he does it good. So here's our outline. We're going to look at the idolatry of Ahaz, and then we're going to look at the result of Ahaz's wickedness. Now, as we look at the idolatry, we're going to have several scriptures that we're going to look at that show us how wicked this guy really was. So the first one is in 2 Chronicles 28, 2, where the Bible says, for he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and he made also molten images for Balaam. So this is the idolatry that he does. First of all, he walks in the ways of the kings of Israel. Do you remember the very first king of Israel when the kingdom divided was Jeroboam? The Bible says that Jeroboam, to keep people from going down to Jerusalem, he set up two altars. One was in Dan up to the north. The other was in Bethel to the south of Israel. And there he set up altars and he made golden calves so that people would come and offer sacrifices to the golden calf versus going a little bit further and going down to Jerusalem. you remember that? And the Bible says that Ahaz began to walk in the ways of the kings of Israel. He began to worship the golden calf. He began to go back to that Egyptology, to what the children of Israel had been delivered from in Egypt. He he resurrects that and brings that back in and begins to worship the apis bull. Very wicked. 
So he's walking in those directions. And the Bible says that when Jeroboam did that, that he got rid of the legitimate Levitical priesthood and he began to hire the lowest dregs in society to work at his altar. This is the same thing that Ahaz is doing. He gets rid of Jehovah worship and he begins to institute the apis bull and the worshiping of golden calves. The next thing he does is, the Bible says he made molten images for Balaam. Now, Balaam is the plural of Baal. So there are several different names for Baal. It's not just Baal as in of itself. But these are some of the names, not all, but some of the names. Baal Berith, the Lord of the Covenant. Baal Gad, the Lord of Fortune. Baal Hamon, the Lord Possessor of Abundance. Baal Hermon, the Lord of Destruction. Baal Hazor, the Lord of the Village. Baal Meon, the Lord of Habitation. Baal Peor, the Lord of the Gap. Baal Shalisha, the Thrice Great Lord. Baal Temer, uh, Tamar, Lord of the Palms. So there are several different types of Baals, and he begins to make molten images for all of them. And he's introducing all types of idolatry and causing Israel and Judah to turn away from the God of Jehovah to worshiping little idols, golden idols, that they could have in their home and they could worship there up on the shelf. Ahaz didn't just focus on a single heresy, but he added a myriad of different idols that you could choose from. And what he literally did was he took them away from monotheism to polytheism to a multitude of different gods. He said, oh, there's bunches of gods that you can serve when we know that there's only one God. Second Chronicles chapter 28 verse 3 is a very telling scripture also. The Bible says, moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He burned his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen who the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So uh, when we hear that somebody is burning their children in the fire, y'all know that that's talking about the worship of Molech. And and I've described this to you. I've told you how it was a brazen uh, altar god, that it was an ugly little statue. He had a hollowed out belly and he, and he sat cross-legged like this with his arms held out like this with his belly hollowed out. And what they would do is they would stoke a fire inside this brazen statue of charcoal. they get wood and charcoal burning very, very hot so that this brass was just burning hot and, and it had its hands out like this. And then they would take a live child and they would put that child in the arms of this burning hot statue and let it roast and, and literally they would offer it as a sacrifice and it would burn to death on the arms of this burning hot statue. Can you imagine the screams, the agony of children, baby children being burnt up as being offered to Molech? And see, this was what the Canaanites were doing when Joshua came into the promised land and God said, don't cohabitate with them. Don't let your girls marry their sons. Don't let your sons marry their daughters. Don't have anything to do with them. Don't make contract. Drive them out. Get them out. Get them away from you. You do not want to inherit the the, the practices of these Canaanites. They are wicked beyond wicked. Do not. Do not take up their practice. Ahaz begins to resurrect the practices of the Canaanites. He burnt incense in the valley of Hinnom. He burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. This is resurrecting what the Canaanites were doing. And the Bible says that it was done in the valley of Hinnom. Now, here, here's how you can think of this, okay? If you think of Jerusalem, think of it looking like an ice cream cone, okay? So at the top, you got this big circle, the big hunk of ice cream, the ice cream cone, Okay? So at the top, you got this, the ice cream, which represents Temple Mount, all right? And, and to the east of Temple Mount, you've got a, a short valley that goes down and up, and it's called the Kidron Valley, okay? And it goes up to the Mount of Olives. So to the east of this ice cream cone is the Mount of Olives. And then to the west and to the south, there's another narrow gorge that cuts down up under here like this, that's called the Valley of Hinnom, all right? 
And, and that's where they begin to sacrifice these children and burn incense. And it stank. And that's where they would go and dump their garbage. And, 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 and there was always a fire and a stench. You can imagine the stench of flesh burning over in this area like this. So that the Bible says that when the children of Israel got back from Babylonian captivity, that became the garbage dump. That's where convicted criminals that had been stoned, they take their body, instead of having a proper burial, they throw them in the valley of Hinnom, and that's where they would burn them with fire. Dead bodies, dead cows, dead animals, they would go burn there. Convicted criminals would be burnt there in the valley of Hinnom. Take your trash and throw it in the valley of Hinnom to where that in Matthew chapter 10, the Bible says, Jesus said, don't you worry about that person who can kill your body. The one you better worry about is the one who can kill your body and soul and cast you for eternity in hell. And if you look at the translation of that word hell, it is the Greek word Gehenna, which is from transliterated from the Hebrew of the Valley of Hinnom. He was giving a picture of what hell was like through the Valley of Hinnom saying, you see where those children were sacrificed and where there was wickedness and stench and smoke and fire all the time? That's a picture of what hell is like. And he literally termed it Gehenna, which is the Hebrew of the Valley of Hinnom. It's the Greek version of the Hebrew of the Valley of Hinnom. That's where we get one of the words for hell is from the Valley of Hinnom. So when you see this, and, and, and here's the other thing that you know. These people that were offering human sacrifices, uh, it, it, it wasn't just a matter of them going, well, we're going to worship, we're going to come today and we're going to worship all for sin. No, 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 no. They were burning incense and offering sacrifices to gain power. This is witchcraft of the worst kind. I mean, they were summoning up demons to do their bidding. That's why they would offer a child on the altar. That's why they were offering incense. That's why they were praying to these evil. They were doing witchcraft and occult and spells. Uh, they knew exactly what they were doing. And, and, and it was to worship and to get these demons to do their bidding. It was horrible. It was horrible that they would go from goodness and worshiping Jehovah God to worshiping these Canaanite gods. And here's the other thing. God gave the Jews such strict dietary laws to, to keep away from what they were doing in Canaan. Do you know why they had kosher laws? Do you know why that God said, you will not eat that stuff? It's because that's what the Canaanites were doing before they entered into the promised land. That's why if you go over into Israel with us this coming March and, and you go um, to a pizza place, don't, don't ask for meat on your pizza because they'll never mix dairy with meat. That's not kosher, and that, that will not be done, not, not in Jerusalem. No, no, no. So if you go somewhere where uh, they're having meat for breakfast, you're not going to get any cream in your coffee. <laughs> Because there's no dairy where there is meat that is unkosher to do that. Why? Because the Canaanites would take a baby and they would boil it in the mother's milk. And God said, you'll never do that. You'll never cast spells like that. You're not going to do anything like that. There's going to be a division between the holy and the unholy. And I will not allow you to make. And, and now they carried it further, but it was basically to counteract what they were doing in Canaanite rituals for, for uh, human sacrifice or even domestic animals. And this burning, stinking flesh garbage dump would become a picture of what hell was like. D, or number four, they adopt the gods of Syria. The Bible records that Pekah, who at this time was the king of Israel, the ten northern tribes, joins with the king of Syria and they will defeat Judah in battle. Uh, so what's the brilliant response of Ahaz, the ignoramus the first? That's what I title him, ignoramus the first. Well, instead of repenting, Instead of saying, God, we have disappointed you, we've broken your heart, we're going to turn back toward Jehovah God, O oh, brilliant one, in 2 Chronicles 28, 22, the Bible says, and at the time of his distress did he trespass yet the more against the Lord, this is that King Ahaz. 
for he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, because the gods of the king of Syria helped them, therefore I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all of Israel. Instead of repenting and turning to Jehovah God, he's going to gather even more gods from Syria. So now he's got the gods of the Canaanites, the god of the Egyptians, and now he said, well, give me some more. I want some of the gods of Syria that helped them. Knucklehead. And then Ahaz goes to visit tilgath Pileser. tilgath Pileser is the king of the Assyrians, and basically he, he takes all the the golden and the brazen altar and, and the things of great value in the house of God. And he's going to cut them up and he's going to take them up there as a ransom and basically say, uh, oh, tilgath Pileser, help me. Help me to fight against the Syrians and against the Israelites. Everybody's beating up on me. I need somebody to help me out. I need a partner and I've picked you. Well, while he's up there, he sees tilgath Pileser's altar. And it's a big old altar to a foreign God. And, and he goes, hey, well, I like that. That's a pretty altar. And, and, and I want that kind of altar back home. So what he does, he pulls out a pen and he sketches the altar on a piece of paper. And he writes down all the dimensions. He steps, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's six feet that way. And then it's one, two, three, four. And it's five feet that way. And he makes a little model of it. I think he takes some clay and makes a model of it. And he makes it all the dimensions. And he sends it by fax or by bird or something. He sends it back to Jerusalem while he's up in Damascus. And he says, I want y'all to build me this altar. And I want you to put it in the holy place. I want you to put it in the courtyard where we worship Jehovah God. And, and, and they basically say, well, what are we supposed to do with the altar, the brazen altar of burnt sacrifice? They said, just move it out the way. Get it over there and put it over on the side to the north side. We don't want that where it's supposed to be. Get that out of the way. And it replaces the altar of burnt sacrifice, which represents the sacrificial atonement of Jesus Christ, which is the shadow of that which is to come. It's the picture in the entire tabernacle of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross and they remove it. They get rid of it to put a foreign altar there and it's a, it's a double picture. First of all, it's a picture of this. Number one, you can't have an idol in your life in Jesus. Somebody's got to move. You, 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 you got to move that idol out the way. In order for you, to, I mean, you got to move Jesus out the way in order for you to move your idol in. The Bible says not only did they move the idol, but they also dismantle the laver. The laver is this huge brazen bowl. And it's a brass bowl that before any of the priests could do service in the, in the tabernacle, they had to go and they had to wash their hands and they had to wash their feet. Now you'd say, well, why don't they just jump in there and take a bath? No, no, no. Because it didn't represent them being saved, it represented them coming daily before God saying, you know, God, yesterday I said something I shouldn't have said. I need, I need to get this straight with you. They weren't getting saved all over again. What they were doing is they were getting washed and clean. The Bible says we need to be doing the same thing, amen? amen. That on a daily basis, we need to come before God and say, you know, God, today I, 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 I was holding a grudge against somebody and I don't want to do that. God, I, I need to forgive them. God, God, I had a bad attitude about this. God, I hadn't been thankful like Brother Sam said I was supposed to be. I want to be more thankful. And, and, and daily we come before God and we wash our hands and we wash our feet. We don't have to get baptized all over again. We don't have to get born again or die. No, no, no. It's just a washing of the hands and feet. But they got rid of the laver, dismantled the sucker, cut it up into scrap metal. They got rid of the altar of burnt offering which represented Jesus and replaced it with it. The second thing it pictured was what's going to happen when a temple's rebuilt in Jerusalem and the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to replace worship with the image. And the image is going to go there, the image of jealousy, which will lead to the abomination of desolation. And, and I, I'm telling you, friend, when you see that, when you see that, what we call the abomination, Jesus said it, Daniel said it, Paul said it. When you see it, you better get ready because the rapture ain't far behind. Amen? That's going to be good. Woo! Somebody said, well, Bill you can't tell the signs. Oh, yes, you can. The Bible says you better watch for this sign. And he's talking to the church. He's not talking to lost people. So, 
This is a picture of that by him replacing the picture of Jesus and putting in a wicked foreign eye. Can you imagine all this? Listen, this is in 16 years. They've had 130 years of goodness and suddenly this knucklehead comes in and does all this stuff in 16 years. But I'll tell you, it'll change fast, won't it? So what are the results of his wickedness? Well, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 28, 17, for again, listen to this, 2 Chronicles 28, 17, listen. For again, the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and they carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah. So we've already talked about Israel coming in with Syria and invading and taking out uh, Judah. And then the Philistines come from the south and attack Judah. The Edomites come from the southeast and they attack Judah. But I'm telling you, they take it on Judah. Everybody's whooping up on Judah, amen? I mean, they can't win at tiddlywinks. So listen to verse 5. 2 Chronicles 28, 5. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria and they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives, brought them to Damascus and he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel who smote him with a great slaughter. So let me summarize for you real quickly. We're out of time. Because of the wickedness of Ahaz, the Bible records that 120,000 valiant men would lose their life in a battle against Syria. 120,000 men would die. Not just regular soldiers, valiant soldiers, great soldiers who were very brave soldiers. Because God's hand was not on that nation, 120,000 innocent men would lose their lives. And then the Bible says they would take captive 200,000 women and children and drag them off to Damascus. Held captive by the enemy. Over 300,000 people would be affected by the sin and the wickedness of Ahaz. And that does not include the captives that were taken by the Philistines and by the Edomites down to the south. That's just to the north in one battle. One battle. One man's determination to sin can affect large, large numbers of people. There's no telling how many people are currently burning in a devil's hell right now because of the idolatry of Ahaz because Ahaz said it's okay it's okay to worship Baal it's okay to worship the apis bull it's okay to worship the gods of Syria they're doing it why can't we do it we'll do what we want to do it doesn't really make a difference and those people that believe that lie that followed in his footsteps are currently burning in a devil's hell because of the influence of one person one person so what are the lessons we learned from this, Brother Sam? Why are we going back and looking at these examples in the Old Testament? Because the Bible says God gave us these examples to teach us lessons for the New Testament believer, amen? So here are the lessons I got, just a couple. First, be careful not to mistake a victory to mean that you're so good. God may have given you the victory because your opponent was so bad. See, the Edomites won not because they were so good, it was because Judah was so bad. God allowed the Philistines to win not because the Philistines were so good, but because Judah was so bad. The Syrians didn't win because the Syrians were so good. The Syrians won because Judah was so bad. So you better be very careful when you go, ah, I, I got lots of money, I must be really good. Whoa, 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 you better watch out. You may be prosperous because somebody else is bad. That's a good deal, huh? Second, never underestimate the effect of one person for good or for evil. One person. That's the difference between Jotham and Ahaz. I think of Ahaz, and in 16 years, he turned the nation to idolatry. He taught heresy. He practiced witchcraft and the occult. He set a pattern that would be followed. Out of the next eight kings, only two would be good. The, the other six were wicked. And some of them go beyond wicked. They were actually vile. 
Foul. Following in the footsteps of Ahaz. But here's the good part. I think we can have a, a negative impact, but I also believe that we can impact our generation for holiness. I, I believe we can. That one person in a neighborhood, that one person at work, one person at school can make a difference, can truly make a difference. One person. If Ahaz could affect that many people for the evil, how much can we affect people for the good? If we preach the gospel in truth that we do not turn away from the gospel. We do not replace Jesus Christ with some other more ornate altar. No, no, no. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. That we continue to support missions. That we never circle the wagons and say it's just all about us. Oh, no, no, no. Somebody said, Brother Sam, you can't uh, afford to go on that mission trip. I, I say you can't afford not to go on the mission trip. Missions are our lifeblood. It's the mandate for the church. Yes, we're going to do ministry here in Flint, but we're also going to do ministry around the world, amen? And we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. In fact, I hope and pray it grows every single year. We support mission. We teach Sunday school. We're going to teach the truth in our Sunday school. We're going to love and minister to those members of our Sunday school. And we're going to live out the truth of our salvation. It's not just talking the talk. It's going to be walking the walk. Amen. So what is the impact? What is, what is the impact? If, if, if one person gets saved in your Sunday school class, one person, and that person surrenders to the ministry and turns into the next Billy Graham, can you imagine? And see, you've won that person to Christ. So that when this person surrenders to the ministry and they go out and they start winning thousands and thousands down in South America and Africa, you know who gets all the credit for them lost people getting saved? I think you do. Because you're responsible for that person getting saved and that person responsible for them getting saved. Amen? What is the impact of your ministry? What is the impact of you praying every day over your family? What is the impact of you teaching that Sunday school class? Or, or, or what is the impact of you going on a mission trip and, and taking somebody a bucket so they can have clean water and therefore they give their heart to Jesus and lead the whole village to Christ? What is the impact of one person being obedient to God? What is the impact that you have? Is it for good or for evil? It should be for good. One pebble in the, in the pond goes spreading out, spreading out, spreading out. I'm going to make some impact. It'll either be good or it'll be bad. I cannot stay neutral. I, I'll either impact people for the good or for the bad. I choose for the good. I want to be for the good. When I've done for the bad, I want to be humble enough to apologize and say I made a mistake. Forgive me. Don't go that direction. Don't do that. We need to go the right direction. Amen. Amen. God's given you all the tools, guys. He's given you all the tools. You've got the word of Almighty God. You, you, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's gifted you. He's gifted you with a gift from the Holy Spirit. He, he's given you orders of what to do. He will guide you. He will teach you. He will, he will lead you in what you need to do. You just got to have that willing heart to do it. So my question as I close is this. What impact will you make? What impact for eternity will you make with your life? As you bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so very much. God, that you give us that choice. God, your Holy Spirit convicts us to live a life of holiness. Not just to try to be a goody two-shoes, but God, to impact others that will be following in our footsteps. God, help us to choose the right God, help us to be a Jotham where nothing bad is said about us. Instead of being an Ahaz that tries to cram just as much wickedness in their life as they can. Heavenly Father, that's never worked for anybody before. God, I pray that we'll have the good sense that we don't have to try out the drugs and the occult and, and the drinking and all that sort of business. God, we can look at other people's lives and have sense enough to know that's a dead end road. That's not a good place to go. Instead, God, help us to make the sacrifice of Jesus Christ preeminent in our lives. 
Because God, what was the temple in the Old Testament is our body in the New Testament. And God, we want Jesus in the forefront so that people will see his sacrifice in our lives. Speak to us now and give us a desire to make an impact. And we'll give you glory for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stand. Brother Billy's gonna lead us in a hymn of invitation. Maybe God's spoken to your heart this, this, this evening and you've been looking for a church home. We've got decision counselors down here at the front. Uh, you can come to one of them and say, listen, I, I want to join this church. I, I, I truly need to be a part of a church family. Maybe you just need to come to the altar and say, listen, I want to make an impact. I want to make an impact on my family. I want to make an impact where I work. I've made a negative impact before. It's time to make a positive impact. And it starts right here at this altar on my knees. So whatever decision God's led you made, you make that this morning as Brother Bill leads us in song. You come. Thank you again for worshiping with us. As a reminder, we have four regular services each week at Flint Baptist Church that are live streamed. Sunday morning at 9 and 10.30 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You can also check out our full website at flintbc.net for other special events and opportunities of service. So, as you've joined us today for a time of worship, if under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you felt the need to renew a commitment to the Lord, or perhaps for the first time in your life, you've decided to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and your Savior, we would love to hear from you. Please feel free to send us an email about this exciting decision to info at flintbaptistchurch.net. God bless you, and thank you so much for worshiping with us today.